Local Gardeners, how may I help you? Hi, and welcome to Calling All Gardeners here on Shaw. It's a show where you get to call in and ask questions to our panel of garden experts and we'll tell you about how you can do that in just a moment oh man that's some tough raking let me first introduce our panel of experts here we have some really special people here for you today we'll start off on the far end we have Carla Hersina now Carla is celebrating 21 years in the greenhouse industry you started at St. Mary's as part-time then graduated to key grower Greenhouse and Giftware Manager? Yep. Wow. Yep, a lot. That's, in, that's impressive. And you have a natural flair for gardening in all aspects of landscape, perennial, annuals, container planting. Now, Carla, she has been featured on CTV's Get Growing, Green Thumbs, and Carla has also written for Prairie Gardener Magazine. Thanks so much for coming on. You're very welcome. Now, moving down the line, we have another great expert here, Dr. Eva Pip. She's a professor at the University of Winnipeg and specializes in toxicology, water quality, and has taught courses in botany and plant physiology for over 40 years. But she's also taught courses in the Master Gardener program, which I'm pretty sure my mom is a part of this year, and is a member of the board of directors of Gardens Manitoba. Is this yes, all true? It is. Wow. We did research. Now, she is a dedicated gardener with a large garden in the Beaux Azures area with a wide horticulture interest, including heirloom tomatoes, water gardening, and habitat restoration. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. And our last expert here, Shay Doherty, has been working on a farm, has, has given him valuable hands on experience, has taught him all about growing vegetables and the greenhouse industry. Now he's been an eager to experiment in greenhouse environment, challenging and experimenting with aspects of Manitoba's short growing season. Wow, that is amazing and I imagine difficult. So Shay has also run a bee farm with over 300 hives and it has given him the ability to see bees and plants interact firsthand. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much Shay for coming on. Thanks for having me. So we're gonna start off with a demonstration here by Carla. So Carla, you have some uh, interesting kind of uh, pieces, some artifacts here. And, and these, are these plants that grow in the garden? What these, are these? These are plants that are growing in the garden. And what we're showing you is an, um, sort of a hobby that's happening. It's called fairy gardening. So it is taking gardens at a miniature scale so we've seen it at a scale where you can do uh, larger structures like your houses up close. You can do them in container gardening as well. But what we see is it's gone from something that's larger to mid-size, and now there's a new part of it that's going even tinier, which is called micro fairy gardening. Wow. So it's almost like teacup size. So it's something that um, you would see many demographics going, right from mothers, grandmothers, grandparents, and Lately, we're seeing a resurgence of the younger demographic of even children coming in. Uh, grandparents with grandchildren, mm -hmm. something that they could participate with, something that they could teach children about gardening. Wow, that's amazing. So can you d kind of explain how, sure. how to get deep into this? Sure. When we're doing it, at basically if you're going through it, we would have a container and you can do it either in a container or I can show you actually a lantern. So sometimes you can do it in soil with a container or sometimes you can do be very creative where you're wanting to do something that's a little bit more enlivened. Uh, you can use even lanterns and changing different things. So if you have small plants, let yeah. me see if I grab this one here. If you have a small plant, you can actually create it almost like a terrarium. So you can place it in, do put it in the side. Do you call it a, a, like a fairy -arium? You could call it a fairy oh, okay. You can call it whatever you, you know. It's a structure where a terrarium type, you're accessorizing, <laughs> you're yeah. allowing the kids to take a look at the plants, care for the plants, and sometimes it's, uh, your demographic too is losing maybe their gardens. It gives them the capacity that if you have a deck 
or a patio oh, yeah. that you can do an extension of gardening. You can do vegetables on gardens, on patios. Mm -hmm. So this gives it a little bit of whimsy, a little bit of fun, and even in smaller plants where you're starting to see ground covers. If I had a large container, I would be using strategically maybe some of my, you know, it's almost like a dollhouse for gardening because you're accessorizing, you're uh, moving things around, you're interactive. And if you're doing some plants that are low base and ground covers, you're clipping, you're mowing, you're raking the lawn, so you're taking mm -hmm. your shears and maintaining it. So you can accessorize with it, or you can even um, accessorize as what, you know, with different structures. But it's just all about the whimsy about gardening. Wow, that's really interesting. I feel like it's something that a lot of people might not uh, be fully aware of. You know what, it's, it's, it has started for the last two years. We've seen a little bit of movement in it, but even this year there's a resurgent because not everyone knows about it. They're mm -hmm. starting to gain the interest of it and learning about the care of it and even creating some of this. We've got some on the stage set, you've got some large uh, bins. So you don't have to go and get a new container. Take something that's refurbished. I think, uh, I know myself, I have an old bird bath and, you know, a fountain that don't, hold water anymore. Mm -hmm. So let's refurbish it. Let's use it something else. And you're creating something by yeah. putting plants in it. You got the drainage because you know it's not going to hold water. Yeah, it's a very, very creative way to uh, to use your plants and uh, and kind of build something interesting and maybe maybe attract a few fairies. I don't know mm -hmm. if that if that is the purpose. You, c you know, it, it's you all about the imagination. And I think when you're yeah. in the gardening aspect, your imagination pay, plays a huge part of gardening because you're creative, mm -hmm. you're designing something. And even on the other side, if you want to create a mini landscape, I know that we have uh, aggregates and stones and rock walls. So you could take natural elements, uh, grab some twigs that have fallen off a tree, grab some <laughs> sand and some stones yeah. from the garden and create some sidewalks. So create your own landscape. That's really interesting. We're going to throw to a break right now and actually give you, the viewer, an opportunity to call in with your gardening questions to our panel of experts. You're watching Car Calling All Gardeners on Shaw. Check this out. Do you have a gardening question for one of our experts on the show today? We would love to hear from you. Please phone in to register your question by dialing 204-480-3500. Leave a message and volunteers will call you back as soon as they can. That's when we put your question out live on air. You can also register your question online. Go to shaw.ca slash shawtv Winnipeg or check our Facebook page. TV is grateful for the support of our community sponsors. Gardeners here on Shaw. Now the show is called Calling All Gardeners so of course it is now time to hear from you the caller. So let's go to our first caller why not? Who do we have on the line? Is it Kim Gessel? That, that's right. Oh Kim there you are. Thanks so much for calling in. You're welcome. Now, uh, do you have a question about gardening for our experts here? I do, actually. Um, I would like to plant some ground cover uh, plants, I guess, or flowers in a, a large, it's not a pot, it's a planter uh, out front of my house. And I'm just wondering, first of all, am I better off to get seeds or to actually go to the garden center and get some actually grown plants? And the second part of that is, if it's seeds, when can I plant them? Okay, who would like to field that question? Oh, I can help you out with that. Carla? If you're, yeah, if you're looking for it, if you're wanting to start with seeds, uh, depending on the selection of the plant that you're wanting to go with, maybe those seeds should have been started in advance. So you're probably, if it's the front door par, uh, pots of your home, that is a statement piece that you're wanting to go through. So I would probably say advise 
going to the garden center and starting with plants that are already established that's on it. Next year, maybe going forward, you'd have to investigate the type of seeds that you want to go through because most of those uh, for those cascading or those elemental, you know, uh, plants that you want to go through, that you might need a longer time for it to actually come to your attrition or to be very full for the growing season. So then, is now too early to put those already grown plants in the ground? Do I have to wait till May long weekend? Is it for the pots though? For if 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 it's in the pots and you have an area that you can grow. Uh, some of them, uh, but I would almost say, you know what, just wait a little bit because you never know. We are in Manitoba. We could still get some frost even though we're experiencing really good, nice weather right now. Uh, you may want to go out and investigate your, your selections to see what your garden center that you usually go to to see if they have the selections for you. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thanks so much, Kim, for that uh, call. Now, uh, I'm I think we are going to go to another caller if we have time. Is there another caller on the line for us? Who do we have next? On calling all gardeners. We, we really need those calls to come in. But if we don't have a caller this moment, we can always remind you that you can call 204-480-3500 <laughs> to call in. Or you can visit uh, Shaw Winnipeg on Facebook to register to call. So, speaking of calls, which I just have been, do we have one now? Is Vivian there? Yes, I, I'm here. Oh, great. Great, Vivian, thanks so much for calling. Now, uh, do you have a, a question about gardening? Yes, uh, I've actually got a couple. Uh, my first one is, how do I keep cats out of my garden? I'm they love to use it as a litter box. Oh, wow. And that's... it's killing my flowers and... Yeah, ca cats ruin everything. Do you... Uh... Mm -hmm. I'll take this one. Shay? Sure. Um, there's two ways you can do it. There's uh, a spray that you can use. Most garden centers will carry it, um, where you'll lace the area. Canine pepper, of course, works as well. Um, oh, gives nice. them hot seas, <laughs> as I call it. <laughs> um, but there's also a plant uh, called Coleus canina or dogs gone is a common name. And that plant, you can plant in amongst your other plants, and it actually does ward off cats, rabbits, um, few deer, and dogs. Wow, there's a lot of options there. Yeah, there is quite a few. What do you think, Vivian? Do you have any cayenne hanging around? Uh, no, but I could sure go buy some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like go to the garden center and throw in some of those dogs gone, or coleus canina. Uh, they really do work. If you rub them, they smell a little bit like a skunk which is why the cats stop coming to and using it as a litter box, because they'll go clean their self later, and it tastes like it smells. So oh, okay. Yeah. You wouldn't want to put it on anything you want to eat? No. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because yeah, I'm, I'm thinking I'd like to plant some, uh, like, tomatoes and stuff like that there, too. Yeah, that'll be fine. And also, uh, my the two, other The two are very correspondent with each other. Yeah. Okay, and uh, you said you had a second question. Yeah. Um, I have tried different, uh, I guess, uh, weed killers to get rid of weeds on my patio, mm -hmm. and they just keep growing back. Can you recommend something that's going to eradicate them once and for all? <sighs> weeds. Yeah, weeds are kind of hard because there's so many limitations of what you can use for an application on some weeds. If it's, uh, if it's weeds between the cracks in the gravel, it's sometimes getting out there and it's the old-fashioned way of using a, a sharp blade and a hoe and just disturbing that area. What happens is if you get a, a weed seed that actually lands within those crevices and you get uh, moisture on there, that is the perfect condition for that seed to germinate. So what you want to do is maybe frequently uh, blowing out some of that with either a hose or disturbing that area so that you're breaking that cycle of that germination of that seed. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, I've tried uh, like Roundup and Weed Be Gone, and it just keeps coming back. And I've I've tried, you know, like uh, trying to you know, scrape them out of there, but they just keep coming back. Yeah, you probably have a source of some of those weeds that are close by, and it's it weeds will blow in. 
uh, at certain times of the season you will get other seeds that are going through. So check your areas too because if you have out by outlying uh, weeds around you that come to uh, fruiting and seeding, they mm -hmm. will blow into those areas. So it's not just your area, you have to sort of look at the areas around you too to help ma ma keep those areas maintained as well. Yeah, you, you could also do a mixture of vinegar and canola oil. The canola oil will keep the vinegar onto the wood a little bit longer. Uh, it'll stop the seeds from germinating because it'll burn the little roots. Because uh, it well, there, there's cement uh, patio blocks and weeds yep, coming I would, up I would in still do the them. vinegar and canola oil. Weeds just make okay. me so angry. <laughs> I really hate All that. All right, well. Well, thanks so much for the, the question. I mean, it riled me up a bit, but uh, very important for people. Always trying to get rid of weeds and, uh, and cats. Just the and cats. It's just the worst. <laughs> but uh, you've got to power through it. Appreciate I wish, your. You know, people would keep their cats in. Yeah, yeah. All keep, right. Thanks so much thank for the call. Thank you very much. Now, we actually Take have a, a question by email, which is uh, a fancy new technology we have here in Winnipeg. And it's uh, from Nancy. Now, the question is similar to uh, one we just fielded. It's how to keep rabbits out of the garden. Mm -hmm. Now, is there a difference between keeping rabbits and cats out? Well, Eva? Well, I can yeah. take that question at least to start. <laughs> <laughs> rabbits are a big problem where I live and deer as well. Mm -hmm. And so there are many strategies that you can use if the rabbits are going into your flower beds, there is that low fencing, the folding fencing mm -hmm. that you can use to physically keep them out. Yeah. But also they hate things like the smell of rotten eggs. So you can make a solution of that and spray it, or you can also make a solution of garlic the, and spray it on your plants too. If you're of course, your garden will smell a bit, but it goes away. The only thing is you have to keep reapplying it. But mm -hmm. yes, this is a big problem. And uh, uh, often, like at this time of year, the rabbits are having their young, so they dig the dens right. in the ground. And if you can find where, where that is, that is a good way to keep them from coming back. All right, thanks so much. Uh that's a, it should be a good answer. I mean, I don't think she's going to be able to email us back in time to mm -hmm. respond, but uh, yeah, little fences, um, rotten egg solution. <laughs> that was the name of a band I was in, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't make it. But we have another caller on the line, and uh, let's go right to her. It's uh, Jessica on the phone. Now, Jessica, can you, uh, can you give us a gardening question, perhaps? Yeah. Um so I bought a fiddle leaf fig for um, my house um, last spring, I think it was, and um, I just Googled the best spot to put it, and it said indirect sunlight. So I put it in the bright sunny room, but not in direct sunlight, mm. and it withered pretty quickly. So we moved it to a sunnier spot, and it kept withering away to the point where it's it's pretty much on its last leg right now. So I'm just wondering if there's any way to revive it. And if not, we probably will buy another one because they're such beautiful plants. What the best way to keep them alive is. The fiddle leaf plant. I can take that question. Go for it. Uh, with the fiddle leaf plant, the important thing is you need to have consistent moisture and also you don't want to change the temperature drastically, keep it out of a draft. Uh, so not too wet, but also not too dry, <laughs> but it has to be consistent moisture. You don't want it to fluctuate too much. And in summer, okay. they do like to go outside, but in shade, and they do quite well during the summertime. Just be sure that before it gets cold, that you take them back into the house. Okay, so do you have an idea of how much I should be watering it or how much water I should be giving it? Well, you want, it, you want the soil to be, when you touch the soil, it should be just a bit damp to the touch, but you have to be careful that you have good drainage because you mm -hmm. want it to become waterlogged. That's one of the best ways to kill it quickly. Okay. And drainage would just be like draining holes in the bottom of the pot yes. or putting rocks in? Yes, never okay. let it stand in water. So uh, when you water it about once a week or so, let the water drain right through to the saucer underneath. 
and then empty the water out of the saucer. Okay. Thanks so much uh, for the call, Jessica. Is that, does that help? Yes, a lot. Thank you so much. Okay, well, uh, thanks so much for all the calls. And now we're actually going to give you some very important information. It's how to call in. So we're going to uh, throw that at you right now. You're watching Calling All Gardeners on Shaw. Do you have a gardening question for one of our experts on the show today? We would love to hear from you. Please phone in to register your question by dialing 204-480-3500. Leave a message and volunteers will call you back as soon as they can. That's when we put your question out live on air. You can also register your question online. Go to shaw.ca slash shawtvwinnipeg or check our Facebook page. Shaw TV is grateful for the support of our community sponsors. Welcome back to Calling All Gardeners here on Shaw. I'm your host, John Wilson, and we've really appreciated your calls, and we're going to get to some more in just a moment, but we actually have a, a special little presentation by one of our experts, Dr. Eva Pip. You are going to talk about toxic plants, the most delicious of plants. Oh, yes, please this explain. Is, this is a very important topic that mm -hmm. is usually overlooked by many gardeners because many gardeners are not aware that a lot of our ornamental plants and even some of the plants in our vegetable gardens, certain parts of them can be toxic. And this is important information because every year there are many, many calls to poison control centers and emergency room visits. And often the emergency room staff are not equipped to be able to handle these cases. They're certainly not equipped to be able to identify what the plants are. So if possible, if something like this does happen to you, then you should be the one to tell them what the plant actually was. And there are many of these kinds of plants that, that we see daily in mm -hmm. our gardens. And some of them are very beautiful plants. We know that plants have been around for millions of years and because they can't run away, from animals that want to eat them, they have developed chemical defenses yes. to try to deal with the problem. And there are literally thousands of different kinds of toxic chemicals that plants produce. And some of these are very valuable drugs that we use, like for example, hard drugs from digitalis plants, foxgloves, or quinine. But uh, in our gardens, the larkspurs, the delphiniums, are plants that are one example that we have to watch out for, monkshood, which is related because these can be, if you ingest them, mm -hmm. and even some of the toxins can be absorbed through the skin. And so when you are handling these plants, it is good to wear gloves and you never put things in your mouth that you are not sure of. On the slide here, we see the lupins and of course, uh, now we see the daffodils and... Uh, you can't uh, eat daffodils? No, you can't eat daffodils. Ah. They are toxic and many people have found this out the hard way. Mm. So uh, just on the monitor, we see some plants that are common examples of the kinds of flowers that we grow in our gardens and that you have to be aware of. For example, uh, the lily of the valley is toxic. Uh, once it has finished flowering, the berries uh, 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 contain very powerful heart poisons. 
and uh, these can be quite attractive to children. So you have to be aware of this. And then we also see on the right hand side, foxgloves. These are beautiful plants that we have in our shade gardens, but they are the sources of very powerful cardiac glycosides, uh, drugs that act on the heart and they can literally stop your heart. So you have to be aware of these uh, kinds of issues. And if you have children in the garden, mm -hmm. from a very young age, you should teach them never to put things in their mouth if they haven't been taught that it is safe because this is how many poisoning incidents happen. And as well, pets will sometimes right. ingest plants. So as well, you have to keep these plants away from your pets. How many of these plants do you have to eat to get sick? Well, it all depends. For example, one lily of the valley berry has been known to kill a child. So it, it will depend on the, the stage of growth, the, sometimes the variety mm -hmm. of the plant and the conditions under which it has been grown, but it is best to be safe and be aware. That is very important information, especially because berries look so delicious. Yes. And there are lots of delicious berries yes. out there. But uh, we actually have uh, another caller in. And thanks so much again for the, that very, very useful. I'm going to stop eating random plants in the garden. It's just <laughs> it's a bad habit. But we have Constance on the line. Are you there, Constance? I am. Oh, great. Thanks so much. What, do you have a gardening question for our experts? I do. I just wanted to give you a little history on these two pyramidal cedars that I have, and I planted them too close to the house, Okay. and they're growing over the eaves, and I want to know how I go about trimming them. Do I do anything specific, or do I just nibble away at them from the top down? I want them to go back down to under the eaves. You, I'll take that one. You can sure. trim it. You can trim it. How, how, how much above the eaves are they? About, um, I'm going to say two feet. Two feet, yeah, you can trim it down. Normally when you're trimming down uh, cedars and everything, maybe uh, generally when we're doing cedars, spruce, and evergreens, we're usually doing that. I call it the Father's Day gift. It's usually their gift for doing that trimming. So wait and see if you get some lush growth on it. Then you can cap the top of it off because um, you don't want it disturbing that. And you'll probably notice that if you're planted close to the house, you're, you're probably balding on the backside of your cedar a little yeah. bit that's yeah. on there but uh, just trim it you once you do it once you're gonna have to probably keep up with it on a yearly basis okay and I have another question about hydrangeas okay do they favor one particular side for planting one particular which north south east or west well that's kind of funny because um, a lot of times people will say hydrangeas favor uh, shade but I've actually seen and located, and if you drive around the Winnipeg, you'll see that a lot of the hydrangeas, or some of them, will actually do a little bit better in locations where they have a little bit more sun. They may get a little wilty because of the heat structure that's on them. They may look a little droopy, but sometimes they will do favorable if they have a little, given that little bit more sun. Okay, so which side would that be? Uh, if you can do later west that's on there, I wouldn't go straight south. But if you're a little bit later on the west side or the east side, you should be okay. If it's in the straight north, sometimes if it's too dark on them, you'll see that they don't reach their full maturity. Oh, good, good, good. And I read an article just this week that if you plant nails in a pink uh, a hydrangea bush in the, into the ground, they'll turn blue. Is that a fact? Well, Actually, I, I'd like true? to answer that. <laughs> sure. Okay, the, the blue color in hydrangeas comes from acidic soil and also aluminum sulfate. Uh, if you add that to the soil, then you're guaranteed to have blue flowers on your pink hydrangea. Awesome. Thanks, thanks well, guys. I love the show. The secret is revealed. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Ooh. But you can't change a white one to pink or blue. No. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Everyone's going to have blue lot, hydrangeas this year. Yes. Okay. Thanks so much, Constance. So uh, let's... Uh, go to another caller. This is uh, a, a man by the name of Rupert, mm -hmm. and he asks, why does miracle Grow smell like gasoline? Is that, is that your question? 
Rupert? Rupert, are you there? Okay, we don't have him there, but uh, I believe his question was about Miracle Grow and why it smells like gasoline. Do I've do never, I, I've never, I've never noticed that either. Is someone pouring gasoline around <laughs> Rupert's residence? <laughs> <laughs> Rupert. I've, yeah, I've it's never, I've I never it, it, gone through it. Yeah, I guess it could be a common smell. I mean, you do have potash, nitrogen, and sulfites mixing together okay. in one mixture, and I guess probably if you do it right when you mix it, you could get a smell. Mm. I see. Okay. Well, uh, we can That's get uh, <laughs> more callers in if you uh, if you'd like to participate in the show. Call two zero four four eight zero three five zero zero or go to the Facebook page for Shaw in Winnipeg. Now, I think we actually do have Rupert here. Are you there? Can yes. We, uh, yes, I'm here. I'm here. Can you uh, kind of give an explanation as uh, to to what your question is here? Well, yeah, I was wondering, like, can I like what? Why does Miracle Grow smell like gasoline? And I, what I was really wondering is, like, can I put it in my car and drive around? Would, would, would that work? No, I don't think you no. can put it in <laughs> your car. I don't think car. you want to do that. No. <laughs> well, you could try, but I don't. Well, you'd, you'd have. I a, mean, is it a nice car? You'd have a big <laughs> car. You'd have a big car repair bill if you yeah. did that. Yeah, we. I, I, yeah, I don't think it's a gas substitute. If that's what you're asking, I don't think you'd even save money. Sorry, Rupert. But <laughs> thanks so much for calling in. You're watching Calling Our All Gardeners here on Shaw. And we're going to give you some information right here. Stay tuned. Do you have a gardening question for one of our experts on the show today? We would love to hear from you. Please phone in to register your question by dialing 204-480-3500. Leave a message and volunteers will call you back as soon as they can. That's when we put your question out live on air. You can also register your question online. Go to shaw.ca slash shawtvwinnipeg or check our Facebook page. back to Calling All Gardeners here on Shaw. And uh, I'd like to thank you for all those uh, calls. Keep them coming. Now we do have another special demonstration from one of our experts. Shay, what would you like to talk about today? You have something in front of you here. Yeah, today Ever I'm going to talk about succulents, which are really starting to become the rave. A succulent is a plant that can drive off of drought mm -hmm. and doesn't need near as much water. They work excellent for those miniature gardens. You can use them almost yes. anywhere. You have an old shoe, throw them in there. Like succulents literally grow. So what I brought today was just a quick little uh, pot here that will uh, work as, or it's actually a wheelbarrow that's been handcrafted and made. Yeah. And this way it'll work good for uh, the succulents. I've already pre-filled it with soil. Succulents like a fast drain soil or something that will drain faster. So because of that, I've already pre-made the soil. I didn't want to get it all dirty and whatnot. Yeah. Make sure you wear gloves, get them ready. Uh, continue to have that product up there. You can go to your local garden center and get some good quality succulents in pots that are pre-planted up. They'll be ready for your containers. So basically you just need the soil, the container, and pick up the plants. Oh, that was that's a lot of information. We got your mic secured on there now. <laughs> right on. Okay, <laughs> good. Uh, so. Great, great volunteers we have at this uh, fine station, Shaw. But uh, maybe, so can you go over some of that again? Just because it might have been, yeah, so might not be able to pick you up on that <laughs> microphone there. Oh, microphones. I know, <laughs> I know. Technology. Let's talk about succulents. <laughs> okay, let's talk about succulents. So I brought here with me a wheelbarrow, yeah. and I brought some succulents with me, and I'm going to pot it up right here on set. Yeah. Succulents are great for, like, if you have an old shoe or an old tin pot lying around. Got um, a lot of those, yeah. They're excellent. You'll mm -hmm. use them in your miniature gardens because they're quick and easy, and you can kind of put them in the corner and forget about them for a month. Yeah. Like they literally drive off of drought and less care. The biggest killer to succulents is people giving them too much care oh. all the time. 
So uh, what I did is I brought a wheelbarrow here. I've already planted some soil in it. Okay. You want fast drain soil or soil that will uh, not retain a lot of water because they don't like that water. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pot them up here right on set oh, for you. Okay, live demonstration here. Yeah. This is how you plant. This is how you plant. That's nice. So this is an elephant plant. Um, it's actually edible. Okay. Um, the elephants in Africa will consume up to two tons of this plant in a day. Two tons? <laughs> two tons of this guy. They eat a lot. <laughs> they eat more than I do in a week. Is that all they eat? Uh, no, they'll eat other product and plants. Okay, well let's talk about the plants, not the elephants. Come on. <laughs> so on. what I'm doing, like when you plant a pot, you want different heights. So I've chosen plants here that have different heights. Um, I always start with the center. When mm -hmm. you're doing succulents, you want some height, and then you want your smaller growing type plants. Yeah. Um, each plant has different conditions that it prefers. Um, so be careful that you choose the right succulents when you go to the garden center. Try to keep them into a little bit of family, um, just because you want them to grow together and look good. Um, when you're doing it, I've kind of the wheelbarrow is kind of slanted to the front, yeah. so I've chosen plants that kind of go in that kind of pattern oh, as you look neat. at it. Yeah. Also, when you're choosing succulents, because they don't bloom a lot, you're mostly basing it off of uh, color and texture. So you'll choose bright colored succulents, uh, guys that look awesome. Mm -hmm. And then what are you what are you adding there? Another. This is a sedum, uh, gold oh. dust sedum. It's bright color, so it'll really pop your eye. Pulls in nice. It'll come over the side of the wheelbarrow and fill in excellent. It's a low one, so it'll fill over the side. Um, next, what I have here is an Echeveria. They're smaller. This is of the larger of the family. Um, I'm going to put them on the side. He won't hide your other succulents because he's a little bit shorter. So there's a room for a lot of succulents in there. I didn't even realize. Oh yeah. Able to fit all that. Succulents like being tight, so you don't have to worry about uh, putting them close or giving them room to grow. They'll do both, and they do it very well. And basically, you just kind of move the soil and push your succulent in. Now they're tough. Again, remember the secret is little care for these guys. So not much water. Not much water. Sunlight. More sunlight, the happier succulents are. Um, they are from Arizona or hot country hot provinces. Mm. Uh, we actually do have cactuses that grow in Manitoba as perennials. Mm -hmm. yep. um, mm -hmm. So we do have cactus or succulents here in Manitoba. I'm just going to put these guys, these guys are going to hang over the front, which always looks awesome. That looks so much better than the empty wheelbarrow. Wheel yeah. And if you have an old <laughs> wheelbarrow at home, you can do the same thing. Fill it up with soil. Succulents drive off of low soil amounts. Yeah. So if you have an old bird bath that started leaking because it rusted out, Fill it with that inch and a half of soil and plant it up with succulents. I saw, uh, people leave old wheel, wheelbarrows by the side of the road every day, you know? You could be, you could be filling them with succulents. Oh, I totally could. Make your front Guys, yard. volunteer your wheelbarrows. Let's get, these, <laughs> yeah. let's, let's get this province let's, beautiful. Exactly. Let's make the wheelbarrows work for us again. Yeah, we'll put them into, we'll put them into service. <laughs> yeah. Now, but, I chose um, succulents on either side because you want an equal pattern with succulents. Okay. Um, again, the coloration, I chose pink, green with pink flowers, yellow, fire sticks, uh, Echeveria with some different color, and then the sedum at the back, just to really pop your eye. If you had this on your front porch, these succulents, even knowing they're not blooming, are totally going to uh, show your neighbors off. Yeah. Like, they're going to go, where did you get... You, you better, like, nail that wheelbarrow down. It might just roll away <laughs> and Starts, right? Again, with succulents, watch your watering. That is one of the biggest keys that, you know, most of the people, we have mm -hmm. over 300 types of succulents in our greenhouse, yeah. and most of the people coming are going, my plant's wilting. Mm -hmm. It's because you've given it too much water. So what happens if uh, it just rains a lot and you have your succulents outside? You, you know, we had a lot of rain last year, Yeah. and the only problem I had with one customer was they put it underneath their eaves trough. Oh, so yeah. Yeah, That's like the, pi the pipe was literally right here. Mm -hmm. And it's like, um, no. <laughs> but otherwise, they can handle it. Uh, where they come from, mm -hmm. the monsoon rains rain for a whole week. And okay. then it stops for the whole year. Oh, so I see. they're used to some rain as well. Wow, that's, that's great. And it's, it looks nice. And, uh, and it looks like you could you know, use a small space. Yeah, like the wheelbarrow is 18 by 12. Mm -hmm. But I do succulents. Like you can get them at garden centers where they're really small, like the stone rock. Um, it's really small and mm -hmm. you can put that like you can make your teacup add a couple structures or whatever to it and add a couple succulents to it It'll live for five years in that teacup. 
Oh, well, OK. So there's so many options for what you could do with your succulents. Now, uh, I think it might be time for us to get to a caller here on Calling All Gardeners. And our next caller we have is Eileen. So Eileen, can you confirm that you are our next caller? Oh, OK. We're going to uh, get uh, Eileen on the phone in just a moment here. And, uh, but I really appreciate the, uh, all the, the succulents you brought here. Now, is that like, like how many succulents are there? There's over 50,000 different types of succulents. Oh, OK. So more than I have in my selection. Could I just add a comment? Sure, go ahead. Fire sticks, you have to watch because they can produce skin irritation, a, a rash mm -hmm. in many people, and they are quite juicy inside. If you happen to bite it, it can constrict your throat so that it's hard to breathe. Okay, so don't eat the fire sticks. That's right. Yeah. Don't okay. eat the fire sticks. Okay, it makes sense, <laughs> the, the name and everything. I think we may have uh, a caller coming up soon, but uh, I'd just like to mention again that this program is brought to you by volunteers on Shaw. And if you'd ever like to volunteer, you can always email createtv at shaw.ca. So calling in is very easy, but uh, we're going we're gonna to get to that in a moment. 480-3500. But we have some other important things to tell you. Now, you're watching Calling All Gardeners. This show is airing live right now, Thursday, 6.30 to 7.30. But it'll also air throughout the month of May. So that means next Thursday, the following Thursday. It's going to air all the way, and our final episode will be on June 2nd. And it's, it's the perfect time to learn all about gardening. So why don't we get to some of those really important pressing questions? I think, I think we have Shannon on the phone. Shannon, can you uh, yes. ask us a question about gardening? Yes, I would like to know what can be done about fighting those red lily beetles. They're mm. terrible. They're just mm -hmm. killing all my lilies and everyone else's. Red lily needles. Beetles. 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 Red oh. beetles. beetles. beetles, yes. Yeah. yeah. You know what, I think combinations are, we've seen that uh, mm -hmm. some trounces that you can get in there, some uh, you know, end all products that are with pyrethrums, you can use that, but you're gonna have to be diligent because that is a contact type of spray that you're wanting to go on it. There's even been parts and it's reminiscent of my grandmother telling me, uh, telling me stories about having pick uh, potato beetles. So yeah. there's the picking mm -hmm. aspect that you can do too. Back on your hands and knees in the garden. Yeah. Back <laughs> on your hands and knees and you might want to just stir up the soil a little bit around the lilies too as well. Yeah. Uh, there is also a product and it is, but it is a chemical so you have to decide whether you want to go chemical or go the other way. So there is a chemical also too called seven that has been effective on it, but most gardeners have to decide which route they want to go on that aspect. I have tried seven. Is it available in Canada now? Because I, when I bought it, it was in, I only got it in the United States. But it's here now. It's always it's, it's always been here. It's probably the, one of the last uh, products that you can use that's yeah. available in the garden centers. But it is still available. Okay, okay, I'll try it because I've never seen such a voracious critter. You know, it mm -hmm. it killed every lily I had in my front yard, and now we're talking hundreds of lilies. Yeah, and you know what, when you're looking at them, you may, um, sometimes even it happens in, in section of my garden, I thought I was uh, prone to not even having them in there, and all of a sudden my daughter's like, uh, all the lilies are gone, and I'm like, what? So yep. you really have to be uh, sort of out there and investigate your lilies if you don't, if you've never had them before, but be very cognizant that they are there, that they can show up, but they, when you do see them, they can cause a lot of damage quick. Yes, and I was just rooting around in the soil the other day and dug up, and there was, it's like a little nest of them. There was like a dozen of them there, so I squished them all, and, you know. So yeah, they will. Yeah, they're, they're just terrible. And yeah. we never had them before. They just came from nowhere. Yeah, and you will find that some people will report that they've had them, and other people will say, on, with on, even on within the same street, I have not had them. So it, I don't, there's no rhyme or reason of why the effect, or maybe sometimes, 
Uh, birds can pick up a couple of them and drop them inadvertently into uh, different locations and you can get the infestation. Hmm. And they do fly a little bit. I don't think they fly distances, but... Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, thank you so much. Thanks so much for You're calling, welcome. Shannon. It's very okay. important. The, the red okay. beetles. Uh -oh. Where do they come from? Do they come from space? The answer is investigate your lilies, right? We have another caller, though. Lisa is on the phone. Lisa, do you have a question? for our experts. I hope you do. Hi. Yeah, Hi. I was wondering about um, my avocado tree. It was really flourishing and I was getting a lot of leaves. And then I was, all of a sudden the leaves started to turn brown and they got spotted and then the leaves started to drop rapidly. Hmm. And I wasn't sure if there was something I had added or if it was the soil or if anybody had a suggestion. My money tree is doing similar things and I wasn't sure if they're from the same family or not. Hmm. Um, it can be one of two things. Avocados are very acceptable to rust, very much the same as bean plants. Because okay. it's brown spotting, it's either lack of iron, um, which okay. means you could be keeping it too wet with not enough drainage, so the water is constantly in the pot rather than actually flowing out, so there's lack of iron in it because the roots can't accept it. Um, or it could be a fungus rust, um, in which case you would need to spray for it. And I can purchase a spray for it at any store, or is there a sort of a Yeah, whole um, there's two use? sprays you can use. Um, there's the organic way, which you would use a copper spray, or okay. you can use a regular bean powder for your garden, um, and that will work as well. And that just comes as a powder form, and you just sprinkle it on your plant. Hmm. And how will I know which it might be? Um, that you're going to know, like if you actually take the plant, you flip it upside down, and you look at the roots. If, mm -hmm. they, if it kind of has an odd smell to it, uh, kind of like a wet dog, you would uh, know right away that it's lack of iron because the plant itself is not receiving it anymore because that smell, the, rot, the roots are rotting, um, that form. If you pull it up and you've got fresh roots in there, they're all white and they look happy, uh, you're mm -hmm. going to be fine. So that's the one way to determine. If the roots are good and healthy, it's going to be the fungus. If they are not healthy, it's going to be the water problem. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks so much. And uh, yeah, avocado tree. Mm. It's delicious. I want one of those. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take one too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you get that uh, avocado problem sorted out, uh, <laughs> you know where to put them in the mail to Shaw for calling all gardeners. What? <laughs> <laughs> put them in for our farm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll all take some. Yeah, split it equal, three ways. Yes, yeah, okay. <laughs> and you know, Good. it's interesting because a lot of people right now are very interested in, mm -hmm. in sort of the growing the fruits. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. that interest in the uh, citrus, tangerines, mm -hmm. tomatoes, uh, toma tomatoes yeah. too, but even doing some of the exotics yeah. Where yeah. You, but yes. that are not hardy here. They want the, the fig trees. Yes, the fig oh. trees. The, they want the best the variety yeah. actually is the Chicago fig. Mm. For indoors, uh, they're expensive. Uh, well, but yeah. but yeah. they but rewarding. They, they they're very long lived and they don't grow very large. Mm -hmm. And then there is guava that also does very well indoors. Mm -hmm. So there are actually many of these. You can you can grow your own pineapples actually inside your house. Yeah. Key limes, citrus, yes. tangerines, that navels. They're all yeah. perfect for patio plants right now, and they do really? best outdoors. Yeah, that's good. That's very good to know for a lot of people. A lot of people like pineapples these days, and uh, I'm one of them. But we also have uh, another call on the line. Eileen, did we get you on the phone live yes. to talk about gardening? Yes, here I am. <laughs> oh, perfect. So Eileen, uh, do you have a question for our panel of experts? Yes, I wanted to know when you're growing herbs in containers, what are the soil requirements? Like I grow them in the garden all the time, but I wondered if you grow them in containers if you need a different kind of uh, soil? Well, yeah. I'll start off with that question. Uh, you want a nice well-balanced soil that is reasonably fertilized, but you have to be careful that you don't over-fertilize with nitrogen 
because many of our vegetables and herbs, they're programmed to take up more nitrogen than they need. And so you don't want them to be too rich in nitrate compounds because that can actually result in a condition called nitrate toxicosis if we eat them. I'm sorry to be harping on, on all this bad poison stuff, but mm -hmm. this is all important for us to know. And this is actually also a, a, a more general uh, a advice for the rest of the vegetables in our garden, especially leafy vegetables, that you do not want to put too much nitrogen fertilizer because even though the plants look very healthy and they're uh, that dark blue-green, that can actually be deleterious to your health if you consume that. So you just want, actually compost is the best to put in soil. You're always safe with compost. You probably don't want to put manure in the veg for vegetables that you're going to eat. And you certainly don't want to be using chemical fertilizers that are high in nitrogen. Mm -hmm. um, also, I wanted to ask you, like container soil, I container soil for flower pots, but would you use some container soil mixed with other soil in the containers or you don't have to do that? Oh, mixing soil? You, you, you can mix soils. Yeah. There's, um, there's, you know what, I think it's sometimes there's different recipes for each person and everyone sort of mm -hmm. has their probably their own perfect recipe. Uh, some, you can definitely grow some of them, but you want to stay away from any container garden mix that has polymers or anything like mm -hmm. that when you're growing in it but there's nothing wrong with growing in a peat base. You may want to supplement it and put in some organic soil or natural soil because A, the peat moss is going to help with the compost and everything to help moisture for your vegetable growth. But what you also want to do is maybe get uh, most of the uh, grower mixes also have a little bit of perlite to help you with your porosity. Yeah, and that's okay. like you, you don't want to use regular garden soil. Regular um, garden soil is very heavy. It goes hard. You don't have the earthworms and beetles and all that kind of stuff moving that oxygen around. So make oh sure that yeah. you do do a mix. Yeah. I, I'd just like to add that you want to stay away from vermiculite mm -hmm. because it contains asbestos. Oh. Oh, I see. That's not good. Oh, but uh, vermiculite would be okay for flower containers, I guess. Well, still, you don't want to be handling it and inhaling oh, the dust. Oh, I see. Okay, well, that's good to know. I didn't know that. Okay, well, thank you so much for the help. Well, uh, any time, because uh, that's the name of the show, is uh, Calling All Gardeners. We have our garden experts here answering your calls, and I'd just like to uh, remind, remind the viewers that you can actually call in si or sign up to be in line. We might not have time for everybody on today's program, but the phone number is 204-480-3500. I say it confidently, even though I'm partially sure, but I'm pretty sure that's it. And you can also go and register on the Shaw Winnipeg Facebook page. So uh, we just have uh, another caller, in fact, because we're just overflowing with calls here. Because, I mean, it's May 5th. It's time to garden. We got Lucas on the phone. Lucas, what do you have to say? Yeah, thanks for answering the call, guys. Oh, no problem. So basically, I built a... Uh a wooden box frame kind of garden bed and uh, I put a cedar sealant on it and I just wanted to know if it would affect the soil and the outcome of the plants that I put in because I'm going to be using uh, it as an herb box. I'd like to take that question. You have to be very careful when you are staining or using any sort of preservatives on wood because many of these are highly toxic uh, preservatives can be either arsenic based or they contain a chemical called pentachlorophenol which is a powerful carcinogen and so you certainly do not want to be growing vegetables or anything you will be eating in these uh, sorts of containers that have been treated and uh, uh, it's best to use either just natural wood natural cedar that has not been treated in any way is all right but you start to worry when you start using these stains and preservatives and sealants because they are toxic and their whole purpose is to kill because you don't want uh, fungi growing there or other nasty things. And so they are deleterious to our health. Plants will very readily take these compounds up 
and uh, you, you really don't want to be exposing yourself to these. Lucas, what, uh, okay. Anyone else uh, yeah, have no. a comment on that, or is, is that? Is yeah, that... I mean, um, I, I stand the outside of it, like I steal the outside of the wood. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that would make a difference if oh. it would fall through. Uh, yes, well, the, you know. as long as the plant roots don't have access to it, then mm -hmm. this is good. I would also like to make a, a related comment here, and that is people that use railroad ties to put around gardens if they're making raised beds for example you do not want to be using these for any vegetables or anything again that you're going to eat because the creosote compounds are toxic and very many of them are long-term carcinogens huh. so yeah that's something i definitely did not know oh railroad ties very yeah. popular <laughs> but yeah uh, that's that's our garden box right now actually <laughs> Okay, well, thanks so much, Lucas, and uh, I, I hope that uh, that really helped, Cam. Yeah, I definitely did. Okay, pre appreciate that. Appreciate the call, and I think we have another caller, so we're going to uh, we'll see if we'll see if we get them on the phone in a moment. But um, you know, people, I could see why they would want to stain or or like you know do up their their garden uh, pots and so forth. Is there, uh, is, is there any other, you know, what, what's well, the best actually, way to dress actually, it up? Actually, what you can do if you have to use these materials yeah. is you should have some kind of impermeable barrier, like a, you know, very, like a four mil plastic, mm -hmm. or even better, some of these uh, rubber compounds that are used like from, that are made from recycled uh, tires and so on. But of course, the tires can also have <laughs> toxic yeah. compounds as well. Mm. So, so yes, as, as long as the roots don't come into direct yeah. contact and yeah. you don't have so, uh, water that can leach these compounds off yeah. the materials and uh, the roots can get at them. All yeah. right, well, well, I think we do have Cam. And uh, let's, uh, let's hear yeah, what you have to say. There. Hey, Cam, thanks for calling. Yeah, you betcha. Thanks, thanks for receiving the call. Um, just a quick question. Yeah, go uh, ahead. We have a, a overgrown uh, garden bed. Um, where basically the question is, how can we kind of restart this thing? It was formerly a uh, raspberry um, bush yeah. garden. Um, it's been basically overtaken by weeds and suckers from a nearby large deciduous tree. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's without. Um, uh, Tearing up the whole backyard. I'm just wondering how we can. The best okay. way to, to we just restart. we just have a, a minute to uh, to answer this one quickly. Sure. How can he help his overgrown garden without tearing it up completely? Well, I guess the first thing we'd have to see is a general picture of what is existing in this bed and looking at the landscape side of it. Uh, showing someone a picture of it, what could be savable and what could be removed. If it's raspberries, the raspberries are just going to generally. Uh, you're going to have to control them because they will just keep suckering and moving onwards. But it's looking at the other plants that are in there that are being the cumbersome ones. Because sometimes if you're overground, uh, overground, you can remove some shrubs or remove some plants and open up the space so it doesn't look like it's overgrown. And you will actually see the health of the other plants that remain will probably uh, pick up or have better vigor on them. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for the question, and uh, and that actually does it for the first episode of Calling All Gardeners here on Shaw. I'd just like to thank our experts for coming, Carla, Eve, Eva, and Shay, Dr. Eva Pip, Carla, Eva, Eva, Eva <laughs> is fine. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to be too formal. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for coming, and I really, uh, I hope the the callers got a lot of great information. You can always get a hold of us at Shaw, the Facebook page, or by calling 204-480-3500 and register to be a caller on the next program. Calling all gardeners. See you next time. <laughs>